you never watched a Hollywood movie, you never met or heard about any American pop culture, you never heard about American society or any human interest stories. The only time you ever heard about America was when a mass shooting happened. Your impression of America, American society would be very different. But as we know, because we live here, because we understand, because we see a larger array of um, images that come through, we know that while mass shootings is, a, is frankly a plague on this country and on this society, it's not the only thing that defines who we are. And the same is true with the Middle East. So despite the wars, despite the instability that is real, that is true, that we hear about, it's not the only thing that defines people's lives. So that's one important element of it. The millennial part of it has to do with the youth bulge that is uh, characteristic of most, if not all, of the countries of the Middle East. So millennials that we're defining here as between the ages of 18 and 35 make up 28% of the region's 500 million plus people. So out of a half billion people in the region of the Middle East, nearly a third of them are, um, are millennials, are just in this age group. And then if we move it to the younger group, the sort of up-and-coming youth, the up-and-coming young adults, we find that in most Middle Eastern, if not all Middle Eastern countries, 60% of the populations in those countries are under the age of 35. So if you take millennials, Gen Z, and children, we're talking about a majority of the populations in those countries. And so what that also means is that millennials, not just in and of themselves, make up a large portion of these societies, but also they're in many ways harbingers for what's going to come down the pike as the teenagers become young adults, as the young children become teenagers, etc. Because a lot of the trends that we'll be talking about today are um, sort of distinguishing features of millennials as compared to older generations, but not necessarily distinguishing as compared to younger generations. And then finally, as the story of Muhammad sort of illustrates, these millennials have much in common with their peers in the US and around the world. And so that first part helps us also as we teach millennials and sort of now up and coming Gen Z students, um, as we want to introduce them to the cultures and the societies of the Middle East, introducing them via understanding millennial culture and meeting other millennials of the Middle East is a nice way to introduce them to the region in a way that's not quite so foreign, that's not quite so sort of off-putting. Um, and this is really important for college students because remember that most college students, when they get to college, they've had little to no exposure to the Middle East in their classrooms. So if you're teaching a college-level American history class, you can be pretty sure that your students have taken 8th grade US history, 10th grade US history, civics, government, other things. If you're teaching uh, an American Lit class, again, your students have taken 12 years of American literature in one form or another. If they're taking an intro to the Middle East class, or if they're taking a class with a unit on Middle Eastern culture or literature or women or politics or what have you, the base level of knowledge is much, much, much lower than if you're teaching something, an American studies subject, or even a European studies subject. And so, the, and on top of that, you're dealing with sort of negative images that have come through through the media and through news stories. And so in many ways, it's more challenging, as I've learned many uh, firsthand, in many ways, it's more challenging to teach college students about the Middle East because their base of knowledge is so limited. So introducing them to other millennials with whom they have something in common is a nice way to introduce them to the region. So they have much in common with their peers in the US and around the world. And at the same time, Middle Eastern millennials face unique challenges that their peers in the US or in other parts of the world may not face or may not face in quite the same way. So that's why this institute, why it is that we decided to hone in on these themes. Uh, and when I say, so now I want to go into a little more detail what I mean about the themes. And so there are three as I was thinking about, okay, what is it that I want you to take away from this? If, if nothing else, what is it that you're going to come away with? When we think about Middle Eastern millennials, there are going to be three terms or three themes that are going to come across over and over again that I want us to think about. 
Number one is diversity. Um, Dr. Boom in his talk last night stressed many times that we should not think about Middle Eastern millennials or even Moroccan millennials or even ultra fans as one monolithic group. That there is going to be a lot of diversity within the societies, within, within the Middle East as a whole, within individual countries, and even at a sub-country level within particular regions and so forth. So diversity is going to be one of the main themes that we're going to see. The second is connectivity. Connection through social media, connection through other forms of, um, through the internet and other forms of communication. Also, we'll be talking a little bit later about the Arab uprisings and connectivity, even when the internet is shut off. Connectivity through word of mouth, through passing out leaflets, through old school types of communication. Um, one of the things that Juan Cole talks about in his book on the, on the New Arabs is that we want to be careful not to overemphasize or give too much credit to the internet and social media. While they played an instrumental role, in and of themselves, it's not in, it, they didn't in and of themselves create the dynamics that we um, have been witnessing, especially over the last decade or so. So connectivity, and then finally agency. One of the things that often happens when we talk about the Middle East, both from the outside, but even among voices from within the Middle East itself, so they tend to talk a lot about sort of outside forces or uh, macro forces that are um, affecting the region. And we're going to be doing that too, so I don't think we're not going to. But the risk of doing that is that it sometimes robs the people themselves, especially the millennials, of their own agency. So yes, there are global dynamics. Yes, there are uh, national policies that very much can hem in the choices and the options and the abilities of Middle Eastern millennials, but they also possess a tremendous amount of agency. And we heard about this yesterday with the Ultras fans, that the police can sort of uh, herd them into the stadium, but then once they're in the stadium, they have their own agency and they sing songs and give chants and uh, challenge the government in the realm that they're able to. So while there is a great deal of control, there's also room in which millennials carve out space to articulate and to enact their own agency. And so these are three things that I really want us to think about as we kind of go through the, um, as we go through the Institute of the Week. Now I included this picture, how many of you have seen this picture before? few of you. So this is a picture of Ala Salah. So uh, let me back up a step and say, over the last several months, uh, Sudan in North Africa has seen a huge wave of protests starting in the spring against their authoritarian ruler, Amr al-Bashir. And in many ways, this photo is kind of iconic of these three themes. So on one level, we have diversity here. So when we think about the Middle East, we tend not to think about Sudan very much. We tend to think about other parts of the Middle East. We tend to sort of put Sudan together with Africa, although Sudan is very much a part of the Arab world. And so we have here a, uh, a sort of, when we think about diversity within the Middle East, we can include Sudan in that. Within Sudan, of course, there's a tremendous amount of diversity. There's ethnic and linguistic diversity, urban, rural, class differences, etc. Now this picture of Ala Salah, she's dressed in traditional Sudanese uh, garb. Uh, and it's the garb of the women who led the initial protest for independence against British rule back in the early 20th century. And so Ala doesn't normally wear the white um, thob that she's wearing right now. But she wore it specifically to invoke, and here's where agency comes in, to invoke the agency of indigenous women-led uh, protest movements against first imperial rule and now authoritarian rule. And then the picture itself was taken by another woman in Sudan, Alana Harun, who then posted it on social media. It went viral, it became a very big deal, and, uh, and became very iconic and symbolic, again, of the role of women in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. There was a strong movement among Sudanese activists to ensure that Lana got credit for this photo. That it wasn't you know, an AP photographer or a Reuters photographer or something like that. It was a local photographer 
who took the picture. And not only did she take the picture of um, Ala herself, but she also took a picture of all the other women taking photos on their phones, taking videos on their phones. And then what Ala is chanting is a sort of traditional Sudanese chants about freedom, about equality, about independence, and so forth. And uh, the Sudanese protests this just happened, as I said, a few months ago. In many ways, they parallel some of the earlier uprisings and protests that we saw in the Arab world eight, nine years ago. But in some ways, they're different. And they learned, in many ways, from the mistakes of the, older gener of the um, previous generation in terms of thinking about how to insist, for example, that the military truly step away as opposed to sort of step away um, and things like that. So in any syllabus, we have course objectives. Uh, and this one is no different. <laughs> so as is uh, in our sort of standard pedagogical language, by the end of the week, <laughs> participants of this institute will be able to, number one, identify economic, political, social, and cultural issues that Middle Eastern youth face. Number two, analyze scholarly readings and apply their findings to the institute's themes, diversity, connectivity, agency. And number three, develop curricula and presentations to bring their new knowledge and experiences to, into US classrooms and to share them with other educators. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're going to be um, sort of focused on. And so there's two kind of elements to the, th to the institute. One is solidifying or enhancing your own knowledge about the region. And so that's why we have a lot of scholarly articles and book chapters and so forth. And then the other part of it is helping you develop curricular material to, in order to um, bring that to people who wouldn't necessarily gain a lot by reading the articles that you all are reading, but you can then, but then can um, benefit from the themes and the distillation of lessons that we've learned and talked about. So here we are. I know you have uh, some write-ups about us. So I won't go into too much detail about who we are. I'm an associate professor in the School of Middle Eastern and African Studies at the University of Arizona. I'm a cultural intellectual historian of the modern Arab world with a focus on Palestine. Dr. Lisa Adali is the director of educational outreach in the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Arizona. She's also a former high school teacher and curricular specialist. Okay. I want to talk a couple more minutes about um, who Middle Eastern millennials are. We got a sense of their age range. We got a sense of the sort of ideas of connectivity, diversity, and agency. I want to go into that in a little more depth. So this is a uh, screenshot from a study that was done last fall on MENA's millennials. And I really want to focus here on the connectivity aspect of it and the transnational dimension of it. So according to the survey of, I think, 1,600 millennials and other various parts of the region, they found 57% are fascinated with other cultures and enjoy learning about them. 55% make sure they are always updated about global affairs. And 47% consider themselves to be a global citizen rather than a person belonging to a single group. And this last one, in particular, I think is really interesting because again, when we hear about the Middle East in the news, we tend to hear them uh, boil down to a specific ethnic or religious or linguistic or regional identity. And, it, and we, you know, news agencies really like to pigeonhole people in the region. Well, there are this, so they must feel that. Whereas, in fact, among millennials in particular, that is uh, the opposite, right? So nearly half of them really see themselves as not part of an individual group or an individual um, you know, uh, society, but as part of this larger global, uh, uh, sort of part of the larger globe, part of the larger world. Um, and in explaining these statistics, it goes on to say that their shifting views um, are in part brought on by the fact that they are no longer confined to the borders of their respective countries or regions and are thus embracing new ideologies and trends that transcend MENA's borders. Increased exposure to the outside world has also altered their worldview, with many sharing a more global outlook. Now, this ability to transcend borders, I want to emphasize, is not always a physical transcending 
Um, one of the themes that we'll be talking about uh, over the course of the week, and, and Dr. Boom alluded to it yesterday as well, is that with the economic changes, especially the last 30, 40 years, we're seeing a growing gap between the haves and have-nots of the Middle East, just like in much of the rest of the world. So those who are in the haves category are indeed traveling more, um, going to other parts of the world, and so forth. But even the have-nots, even those who physically um, can't, afford, can't afford to physically travel to Europe or to other parts of the Middle East, nonetheless are engaged in those other parts of the world through media consumption, through social media, through satellite TV programs, et cetera. And so understanding that dimension, I think, is really important as well. And it helps explain why it is that they're open to these other cultures and these other um, uh, perspectives. Now, when we look at how millennials access this information, we find that the vast majority of them are on the internet. Um, and 97% is a pretty remarkable number, given how spotty the internet can be <laughs> in many parts of the Middle East. Um, the 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, you know, phone, uh, ready to, that's not the case in many parts of the, of the Middle East. It often, you might find like 2 or 3G in certain parts in, in many cities, but not everybody lives in cities. And so what's remarkable to me is that in a lot of the countries where we're talking about 60 to 70 percent uh, of the population lives in urban areas, yet 97 percent are on the internet. So a lot of rural, uh, a lot of millennials who live in rural places are nonetheless finding ways to access the internet. Could be through cyber cafes, it could be through trips into the city where they can sort of access it while they're out and about, not necessarily from within the home, uh, but they prioritize and make an effort to access the internet even though it might not be readily available to them. 94% uh, are present on at least one social media platform. Uh, many of them are on Facebook, uh, although Instagram is also becoming more popular. Twitter is less so, it depends on the country. Um, some of the Gulf countries have higher Twitter um, engagement than some of the other countries, um, but Twitter and Facebook definitely. 56% are always looking for ways to integrate technology into their lives, and that's one of the things that I mean when I talk about the millennials being harbingers. So many of them are at the forefront of the integration of technology into their lives, into society, and so forth. I think as we, you know, in the future, when we have future institutes and we look at the sort of young people who are currently teenagers, like junior high, high school, five, six, seven, eight years from now, they're going to be in their 20s and we're going to see probably a higher percentage of that, of that integration. Um, and then finally, 51% always make sure they're online and connected, which as I said, is no easy feat um, in many parts of the region. Okay. So again, emphasizing connectivity emphasizing diversity. One of the reasons why they want access to the internet is to be able to, con to get access to diverse views, opinions, perspectives, um, situations, so forth. And then agency. They're actively seeking out these, these connections. Um, it's not something that is just sort of passively received to them. They have to go out and access it and seek it and so forth. Sometimes at great risk, too. Um, when we talk about censorship, when we talk about surveillance, um, that was a big theme that comes up in Juan Cole's book, the risks that come in with even just going to a cyber cafe and looking up something political, something like that. Okay, so that is in a nutshell kind of the themes and the objectives of the course. We'll give you an overview of um, who the millennials are. As I said, one of the major goals of the um, institute this week is though to also give you tangible um, tangible things that you can take back with you and use in your classrooms or use in your, um, in your universities and colleges. And so I want to share with you briefly, as we sort of transition into the, next, um, into the next segment, one sort of lesson that I've used in my classrooms that I've found to be useful, although its usefulness may be waning a little bit because it's starting to get a little bit dated. But I'm going to talk about it anyway. So. Back in 2014, Pharrell Williams' Happy Song, you guys all know what I'm saying? Happy, happy, happy. Okay. Uh, it was a pretty big phenomenon, and lots of people were doing their own sort of happy videos in different parts of the country. Middle Eastern millennials were not exempt from this uh, global viral phenomenon. And so you had, um, in spring of 2014, 
lots of different uh, groups in, different, in pretty much all of the countries of the Middle East uploading their own versions of the happy song. And when we, we're going to go through some of them in a minute. I won't go through all of them, but I wanted to give you a lot of links so that you can um, use them on your own. Um, but one of the things that I like to do with this is play clips uh, from some of these different countries while helping them sort of, while helping students think about, okay, well, what are some of the things that you see that are similar to what you might see to a version of this in, say, Tucson? And then what are some things that are different? So I haven't tested this yet, so hopefully it's going to work. Let's see here. So we'll start with Egypt, the largest population-wise country of the Middle East. There, there's more coming. So, but just in this brief clip here from Egypt, what were some of the things that you noticed about, um, about who's on the screen? Or about what they're doing? Individualism. Mm -hmm. Individual. Okay. I also thought that, I mean, I guess in tune with the song, the, the dancing styles were very like Western, mm -hmm. you know, not like traditional Middle Eastern type dancing. Okay. Like, it's everyday life, like mm -hmm. indoor, workplace. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of levity in the video. Uh -huh. A lot of Western dress, mm -hmm. differences in skin tone. Mm -hmm. No, yep. which is very much part of Egypt, yeah. Also, there were two people posing, I guess, the other gentleman and his camel. Mm -hmm. They're like trying to throw in some flavor for other kind of Egyptian. Mm -hmm. What else? Also, there is a pet culture in the yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Oh, see, I didn't know that. That's good to know. Now I'm going to play this for a second. Huh? So, okay, we're going to turn down to Istanbul. So, okay, what are some of the things you noticed about this one? Well, I noticed Istanbul, but there's very urban settings, like apartment buildings in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. What else? And the stunts with the boxers and the plates, and they've got like a big scene with the British guy in the back. Mm -hmm. So the video production quality is quite high, and then you also mentioned flags, which we see in the Egyptian, we're going to see in most of them. So there's also a lot of national pride that comes with this, this idea of, again, representing who we are and where we're from to the rest of the world. So there's a very deliberate, larger, I would say political um, uh, sort of impetus behind this, which is to say, yes, we want to participate and partake in this kind of global cultural phenomenon, but we're also thinking about um, Du Bois's concept of double consciousness. There's a very strong double consciousness among millennials of the Middle East, whereby they know what they know about themselves, but they also know how they're perceived, particularly in the West. And so there's an attempt to 
counteract a lot of those prevailing negative stereotypes through the production, through the high quality, through the focus on urban youth, through the focus on Western dress and Western dance and so forth, while at the same time pulling in more traditional. So you saw the traditional Egyptian, we'll see some other traditional. So I, I'm not sure about the dress of the man who was dancing in the apartment building with the mm -hmm. kind of Roman painting mm -hmm. style on the wall. I thought that was interesting. I'm not sure about it either, to be honest with you. I don't know, because it, it looks like it's it does. Both ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. It could be, it could be. The intergenerational. Mm -hmm. Good, the intergenerational. That's another theme we'll, we'll come back to, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Lots of shopping and commercial spaces. Yeah. Commercial spaces. <laughs> and that speaks to a uh, couple of things. One is the neoliberalization of the economy, whereby shopping are some of the few public spaces that are open, which is also happening here for that matter. Uh, but then all, but there's also, because of the urban settings, you have uh, the, the um, souks and, and bazaars have also been traditional spaces of gathering. Mm -hmm. considering who is observing. Mm -hmm. But also mostly gender segregation, next to ever to yes. examples. And I might be biased because I know what happened if the students who were arrested in Iran yep. in this video, uh, mm -hmm. and the excuse was because it was men and women together, mm -hmm. um, dancing together. So, but uh, there were a few instances that it seemed like maybe family, but that's mm -hmm. not the right, but mm -hmm. in general it was, it was groups of people dancing in a single set. Mm -hmm. And we'll turn to the Iran one, here we go. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. So Iran, so out of the list of all of the ones that, I, that I've posted and all of the ones that I am aware of in terms of the happy phenomenon, and I, I have a sampling, there's many more, um, Iran is the only case where it was tr transgressive and where people were seen as having transgressed uh, the norms of the, uh, well, the government accused them of transgressing the norms of society. Um, and one of the other things about Ira the Iranian case, as you can see with the women in particular, is that it's a very much a focus on, and the participants of the uh, participants in the video were those who were also pushing the boundaries of uh, acceptable outer dress and were uh, norms of hijab and so forth in ways that we don't see in other parts of the uh, Middle East. So one of the things that I also make sure to do when I um, when I when I do this exercise in my classes is to talk about. The, the consequences for some of the Iranian participants, but to also stress that that wasn't representative of the entire Middle East. Because one of the things that often happens is that the exceptions get understood as the norm, right? And so while in Iran this was seen as, you know, there were, there were uh, consequences under an authoritarian regime that has very strict, attempt, that tries very carefully to codify what they consider to be proper Islamic protocol, that wasn't the case in the rest of the Middle East. That wasn't the case in the other um, in the other videos that we saw happening, whether in urban places like Istanbul, where you have a very sort of cultured norm of westernization and so forth, but even in some of the rural areas as well. So if we turn, for example, to Mor the Moroccan video, I'm gonna close some of these before, I maybe not, let's see. Mm. So the Moroccan one, if I remember correctly, I didn't pick the, um, I picked Agadir, as opposed to Casablanca or Rabat, because I wanted to also talk about some of the provincial uh, cities, as opposed to just the really big Make ones. Video to show that our city, which is Agadir, is happy too. <laughs> and so you have the regional pride. Our city of Agadir is happy too.
So again, a lot of the same themes that we've been seeing in terms of millennials, in terms of acculturation to Western styles of dress and dancing and so forth. So the last, I'm going to, I'm sort of <laughs> belaboring the point maybe a little bit, but the last two that I wanted to quickly show, um, I also wanted to sort of emphasize them because we talked at the beginning, I talked at the beginning of the presentation about how the Middle East is often associated with war and how young people are very much aware of this fact. And so I, I was um, interested to find, as I was sort of searching for these, that we also have one from Aleppo that was done in 2014, um, shortly after the, that city had seen a uh, really intensive bombardment campaign and war and so forth. And it's done by a, an Armenian Christian Youth Soccer League. Uh, and so that's why you see Armenian at the beginning. So we can also talk about diversity in that way. And then last but not least, and we'll talk about them together, I wanted to show the Gaza Strip. Now this was done just a couple of months before the latest war in 2014 that really um, sort of devastated the Strip, but they had already lived through a number of wars before that. If we compare and contrast just the Aleppo and Gaza for a minute, focusing just on those two, we find some really interesting sort of ways to compare and contrast them. So what are some of the similarities and differences that you see just when thinking about the Aleppo and Gaza ones? The Aleppo ones seem to have, you see Armenian kids just on a, in an empty street outside, mm -hmm. and it felt really warm. Mm -hmm. Whereas these kids, they were like, one of, it looked like a gaming station place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More of a communal. Yeah. And I think in the Gaza um, uh, video, they mix their own oriental dances. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a perfect example of globalization. Mm -hmm. So they mix their own dancing with the happy dance, mm -hmm. whereas the elf one does not. Right. So you have the, the sort of break dancing and uh, I don't know what they're called anymore these days. <laughs> but yeah, you have a very sort of modern dancing, but then you also have Depka, which is a very, very traditional folk dance from that region. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I also think the um, Gaza one, at least given what we've seen elsewhere, is the most um, like social looking. Right? Yeah. Like it's the biggest group that we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. Not really mm -hmm. like a, not an entire region. Mm -hmm. So kind of that mix is and that speaks to the population density of Gaza. So D Gaza Strip is one of the densest, most densely populated uh, areas of, of the world, not just of the Middle East. Um, it's also one of the youngest. If you were to break down the age breakdowns within the Middle East, Gaza tends to be among the youngest. And so that's partly why you see a lot more kids, for example, and so forth in there. Um, and then one of the other things about Gaza, too, is that, I don't know if you noticed, but the women are also a little bit more demure mm -hmm. in, their, in their dancing. So Gaza is a, a bit more of a conservative uh, society than some of the other places that we watched, and so there's also an element of that as well. The Aleppo one looked choreographed mm -hmm. more than any of the others. The others looked more spontaneous. Okay. Good. Anything else? I was yeah. really struck by the standing on columns mm -hmm. uh, sequence. Mm -hmm. Instead of that, kind of 
isn't the right word, but like the ways in which bo the bodies are occupying space. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, I don't know. I say some blurred words to show you these moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems yeah. Concept, right? Those are the bodies are sort of like unconventionally pervasive spaces of two. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. And so thinking about, so all these are all fantastic uh, comments and you can all, I think, imagine using these in your classroom in sort of different ways to focus on different themes, whether it is bodies through space, whether it's gender, whether it's music, whether it's um, choreography, whether it's video production, so forth. So there's lots of different ways to think about how millennials themselves in just the space of a couple of months back in 2014, we're really connected to both a global phenomenon, but then also very much localizing it as per their own um, norms, as per their own desires, as per their own wishes in terms of how they understood this at a local level. So again, the local and global coming together is something that we can see through, through here. Okay. So then, to, so this is basically this portion of my presentation is an introduction to the institutes with some of the major themes that we'll be talking about. I'm going to move next into talking about um, geography and history. But I think right now it might be nice to take a short break, maybe like five minutes if you want to use the restroom, grab some coffee, etc. And then we can just um, quickly reconvene in like three to five minutes. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so now we're going to move on to an introduction to the geography and history of the Middle East. As I said, for some of you, this might be kind of basic. For others, maybe not so much. Uh, and then also, again, sort of thinking about pedagogically, how do we help our students understand what is the Middle East, where is the Middle East, and so forth. And so in order to do that, uh, I'm going to share with you another activity that I do. This is um, when I teach um, Intro to Modern Middle East History, which is um, sort of under, under class. Uh, you know, I have freshmen and sophomores in there primarily. Um, this is something that we talk about because it's one of it's something um, that some of you may already know, but the term Middle East itself is a bit loaded, um, and we'll, we're going to sort of talk about why that is and, and how we help students understand it, even as we use it. Right? So there is a there have been pushes periodically over the years, over the decades, to try to move away from using the term Middle East, and in fact, uh, ten years ago or so. Uh, our School of Middle Eastern North African Studies here was actually the Department of Near Eastern Studies. Um, and Near Eastern Studies is an even older term, even more historic term. Uh, it was sort of old fashioned, nobody knew what it was. And so we said, okay, well, let's think about what do we want to call ourselves. And we had some colleagues who really pushed for not using the word Middle East, using Southwest Asia, using West Asia, using something else. Um, but basically, we had to come to the consensus that while it may be objectively more true and maybe politically more correct, nobody knows what West Asia is or what South Asia is, uh, Southwest Asia is. And so we ended up using, uh, naming our school, School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies. So it was not without uh, sort of deliberation. Um, and so one of the things that we can then think about is why we, why we use the term, what's useful about the term, and what are some of the limitations of the term. So, so, what is the Middle East? And so what I do in my class is I give students a series of maps, you're gonna see them now, a series of slides, um, and we think about what's included and excluded when we talk about maps of the Middle East. And I just basically did a Google image search, Middle East map or map of the Middle East, got a whole bunch, and sort of put them up sequentially. So where, what is the Middle East according to this map? Mm-hmm, Levant, Persian Gulf. Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. And Iran and Turkey. What's not part of the Middle East according to this map? Sudan, Sudan Asia, Palestine, Iran. North Africa. Good. All right. What about this one? How is it different? What's included or not included as compared to the previous one? <coughs> so Sudan is included now. Ethiopia, Ethiopia Somalia, Djibouti, uh huh. The Caucasus, it goes up. You got a tiny bit of Afghanistan there on the end, tiny bit of Pakistan there on the end. Bulgaria. Bulgaria, Southeastern Europe yeah. as well. More water. Yeah. Pardon me? More water. More water, more of the water bodies are included as well. Okay. The West Bank is actually kind of Yeah, the West Bank is sort of carved out in there, teeny tiny. Good. All right. What about this one? 
<laughs> so Egypt, which in many ways is the heart of the Middle East, or the heart of the Arab world at least, yeah. <laughs> it's not there. Wow. So, so, so far we don't have a consensus really. Uh, well, that's not true. We have consensus in some areas, right? So the Levant is in all of them. The Gulf is in all of them. Um, Iran and Turkey are in most of them, I think. Let's see. Now here we finally get North Africa, right? But what's missing? Turkey. Turkey. So Turkey, which is the second or third most populous country in the Middle East, is now missing, even though <laughs> Turkey ruled over this entire region, with the exception of Iran, ruled over this entire region for several hundred years. Does that have something to do with the World Bank and the next one deciding Turkey gets to be up in the middle? So part of it has to do with who's making the maps. Who is deciding? So this is a UNESCO map, and so yeah, Turkey is there's a there is as probably many of you know uh, a move in some quarters for Turkey to be part of the EU. There's also resistance for that to happen, both in the EU as well as in Turkey itself. So who is making the maps is a really important question, and that's why I also included the links for all of these because it's not just a sort of neutral, objective body. Like if you say, show me a map of the United States of America. Show me a map of the continental states of the United States of America. We could do that, right? When we start getting into territories, it gets a little bit more murky. But if you say, show me a map of the continental US, pretty straightforward. Show me a map of the Middle East, mm, not so much, right? Uh, but at least we have North Africa. We hadn't seen North Africa <laughs> yet. But here we have Libya, we have Tunisia, we have Algeria, Morocco, and even um, Western Sahara. But we don't have Sudan which is interesting. And we don't have Mauritania, even though Mauritania is an Arabic-speaking country. All right, so our working map, for the purposes of this institute, is the closest one that I could find that sort of encapsulates what it is that we're going to be talking about. So it includes Iran, Turkey, the Levant, the Gulf, uh, Egypt, North Africa, Sudan. Um, this map includes also Mauritania, Somalia, Ethiopia, Djibouti. We won't be talking about them as much, but they are I think you can say a legitimate part of the Middle East, particularly, and we'll um, get into a little bit more detail about this a little bit later, but um, partly for linguistic reasons. So if we think about how we define the Middle East based on uh, socio-linguistic uh, groups, based on ethno, based on geography, also based on how they themselves define it, so Mauritania, Sudan, they're part of the Arab League, for example, um, and so they're included in that body by that group sort of indigenous group as opposed to UNESCO or the World Bank making those decisions. Okay, so, so far we know more or less what is the Middle East, then the next question is where is the Middle East? And this is where the term Middle East comes in for questioning. So does anyone know the origins of the term Middle East? So a century ago, this region was called the Near East, as opposed to the Far East, and then in the sort of 50s, it got relabeled Middle East. Doesn't that have something to do with the U.S. government and military mm -hmm. and segregation sort of took more perspective from what would be mm -hmm. near the Korean War, mm -hmm. Central Vietnam, Vietnam? Yep. So it was actually State Department and um, U.S. military designations of uh, Near East, which would be Turkey, Greece, Cyprus. Middle East, which is basically sort of this region, and then Far East, which was um, sort of everything west of Iran slash Afghanistan. Okay. Um, it also kind of turns the British strategic issue, mm -hmm. calling Afghanistan and Pakistan mm -hmm. the Middle East. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what else to call it, that's right. So this was the East India Company, right? And then this is sort of in the middle somewhere. This was the Near East for the British. And so that's why Pakistan and Afghanistan sometimes get put into maps of the Middle East because of the British designation, even though they weren't part of the Middle East according to the um, CENTCOM designation, okay? East of what though? East of what? <laughs> east of Europe, east of America. And so the Middle East is one of those regions that is defined relationally, mm -hmm. in relation to Europe, in relation to the United States, as opposed to being defined on its own objective, to the extent that we can say objective, terms. 
which is why we've had over the last several decades um, significant numbers of academics, activists, and others who've said we need to ditch the Middle East as a label and use West Asia, use Southwest Asia, Southwest Asia and North Africa. North Africa at least is a sort of objective geographic designation. It's the northern sort of part of Africa. But Middle East is this sort of weird thing. But again, as I said a few minutes ago, the ubiquity of the term makes it really, really difficult to, um, to chuck it, to get rid of it. And then if you're like our unit here at the University of Arizona and you're trying to uh, attract majors and you're trying to get students to sign up for your classes, um, they barely know what the Middle East is. <laughs> You say, oh, come take a class in the Department of Southwest Asian and North African Studies. Come learn about what Southwest Asia is all about. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of students signing up. All right, but the Middle East is in the news. And so this is one of the things that, one of the kind of balancing acts that we in academia need to think about, which is to what degree do we engage with the sort of news discourses, media discourses, um, national security discourses about the region, and to what extent do we push back against them? And so we, we bring them in with Middle East, and then we have an exercise like this the first day of class to say, wait a minute, even though we'll be using the term, um, we want to be, be sort of um, aware of its limitations. One of the other things about the Middle East that um, a lot of Arab scholars in particular sort of have issues with is that the Arab world in many ways you can talk about in a cohesive way. They have shared linguistic uh, sort of background. They ha there's the Arab League, which and you can talk about inter-Arab uh, relations and the Arab world and so forth. The Middle East, you bring in Iran, you bring in Turkey, you bring in Israel, um, and it sort of complicates things a little bit more and makes it more difficult to talk about the region uh, comprehensively or cohesively maybe. So that's where is the Middle East. So, so what is the Middle East? Um, so our working definition is that it's a common term for a geographic area that extends from Southwest Asia through North Africa and sometimes beyond. It includes the Arabic speaking countries um, of the Arab League, as well as Iran, Turkey, Israel, and sometimes Somalia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And then as we've talked about, Middle and East are relational terms. And so we want to make sure that we stress to our students that um, it's not something that should be taken for granted, that it's something that is, is um, an expression of Western centricity, Eurocentricity, US centricity. And so when we think about um, sort of cultural competency, for lack of a better word, or other ways in which we want our, our students to recognize that their view of the world is not the only view of the world, right? And that people are looking back at us and saying, hey, wait a minute, we don't want to just be known as this sort of war-torn region. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, do millennials in countries identify themselves as Middle Eastern? Mm, rarely, I'd say. They tend to identify themselves um, by country sometimes by um, sort of linguistic or something like that, ethnicity, sometimes regionally. So you saw the Agadir, we're from, not Morocco, we're from Agadir, right? So that there's a, a strong regional pulse. But <coughs> as one of the sort of earlier slides showed, that is a sort of way of being like a White Sox fan, right? You can be a White Sox fan, but it's not going to usurp your identity as an American, for example, right? So thinking about the multiple, multiplicity of layers of identity, uh, millennials are no different in that sense from, from millennials anywhere else, right? Yeah. Uh, as a follow-up, I just wanted to ask about the countries that identify as Arab. I know there's some, mm -hmm. you know, um, that are not exactly clear on it, but other countries that are clearly don't consider themselves to be Arab. So Iran would definitely not consider himself to be Arab. Uh, same with Turkey. So what you tend to have is um, 
are the sort of states that define themselves officially. So when they declared independence, they declared that Egypt is an Arab state, for example. Right? And so there's the state definition. But then there are lots of minorities, and we'll get into minorities um, in a few minutes, who don't identify as Arab or who identify as a mixture. This is particularly true in North Africa, where you have a large Amazigh population. Um, this is also true in parts of the Levant. You have small communities, for example, of Assyrians, of Armenians, of Kurds, who identify themselves in contrast to Arabs. And there's some really interesting discussions about the extent to which um, we can talk about an era, um, a history of Arab imperialism or Arab colonialism sort of culturally on these um, populations and linguistic groups that predate the Arabs coming to that region. Um, and so, I uh, hadn't planned on talking about it, but I will. Uh, in a minute, when we get to the history, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of the history of what we mean by Arab in the Arab world and so forth. Yeah. Is it a political, is it a more politically distinctful in the U.S. to see identification related to our country versus Middle Eastern? It's never. Middle Eastern has always been, and this is sort of my point earlier, Middle East has always been a Western designation. Right. So the only time you see a Sharq al-Awsat, which is Middle East in Arabic, is in like geostrategic reports okay. or on cable news, on satellite news. You know, it's, n it's never a sh like people on the ground, not just millennials, generation above, generation below, no one says, hey, we're all part of the Middle East. You know, they'll identify either by region, by city, town, region, they'll identify by country, or they'll identify by linguistic group, the Arab world, for example. And this is also reinforced through popular culture. So l language is really, really important in this regard because that's how most culture is consumed uh, th through language. And so you'll have, for example, really, really, really popular um, contestant shows, reality shows, with names like Arab Idol, uh, with names like The Voice, Arab Style. There is Project Runway that uses Middle East. There's Project Runway Middle East, but it's, again, done in Arabic. Um, and then Turkey has its own reality shows. Um, Israel has its own reality shows. And so the lingu and, and it's a really linguistic barrier. Um, there are, for example, Turkish soap operas that get dubbed into Arabic and played in the Arab world and are really popular, but they're known as Turkish soap operas. You know? So the language is really important, and actually that helps transition us nicely into thinking about language when we think about peoples of the Middle East. Again, in order to emphasize the diversity, it's really important to recognize the differences between the languages and remember that they're mutually incomprehensible. So, you have to, so we, for example, here at the U of A, we have a large number of students from the Gulf who study Turkish as their like, Middle Eastern language. Uh, why? Because they're not going to learn Turkish any other way. It's not something that you can just pick up by listening. So they study it because they are business majors or they want to travel there or what have you. Um, so there are four main languages in the, in the sense of being official state languages, um, Arabic, Persian, Turkish, and Hebrew. But then you also have lots of sort of sub-official languages. We have a range of Amazigh languages. So what is sometimes referred to as Berber is actually, um, as Dr. Boom said, is Amazigh is the more um, sort of appropriate term, but it's not a single Amazigh language. There's Tamazigh and there's many others as well. Um, and so a lot, and they're predominantly in North Africa. Now a lot of Amazigh peoples are bilingual in the sense that they'll speak um, uh, Tamazigh, for example, at home, but they'll learn Arabic in school and it'll be out and about in their street and in, in sort of their daily lives. Um, many of them are, are sort of trilingual with French or quadrilingual with English as well. Um, you have Kurdish, so you have Kurdish populations, particularly in southeastern Turkey, um, in northern Syria, northwestern Iran, um, and the Kurds are uh, very proud of their linguistic um, identity. In Turkey, there is a history of suppression of Kurdish as a language as well as an identity because it's seen as a political threat to the Turkish regime. And so we can think about linguistic diversity having a very strong political dimension. Um, in Israel, Arabic had been, until recently, designated as an official language. It's been um, sort of downgraded recently uh, through the nation state law, and that also has very strong political consequences and strong political um, reverberations, politically and socially and so forth. 
So thinking about language is really important because that's the primary way in which people sort of, when you say, what is your identity? When they say, I'm Arab or I'm Iranian or I'm Turkish or I'm, they're not talking about it in the sense of having a pure bloodline. They're not talking about it in the sense of my ancestors, ancestors, ancestors were from this one region. They're usually talking about it in terms of linguistic. And if you were to do, you know, take DNA samples across the region, you'd find that there's an admixture. There's a lot of mixing of um, sort of DNA and bloodlines and ethnicity and so forth. But that's fine. Nobody has a problem with that because that's not really how people identify themselves. Okay. All right. So languages is a really a primary way in which people identify themselves. Um, and then tied to that, the, you know, you can imagine a Venn diagram with a great deal of overlap. So related to language is ethnicity. Ethnic identity is usually tied to language. Um, and here, uh, this sort of, uh, to reiterate what I said a couple minutes ago, the politics of majorities and minorities uh, often, or can on occasion create tensions when it's weaponized, right? So uh, you have majority populations and minority populations, linguistically, um, ethno-linguistically, et cetera. Uh, when things are good, they're fine. But when there are tensions, it could be economic tensions, political tensions, um, uh, scarcity, those kinds of things. You know, as we're seeing in this country, there are ways to whip up animosity against minority groups. Um, and so we see that happening on occasion in the Middle East as well. It's not the norm. So again, we don't want to pathologize the region. We don't want to be like, oh my gosh, they're always crazy and blah, blah, blah. Just like we wouldn't do that in our own country. There are occasions when politics of majority and minority are weaponized, are used for political ends. And then we also have a strong emphasis, uh, sort of countervailing forces. If we have time later, I'll show you another Egyptian um, uh, music video that highlights the diversity linguistically, uh, not linguistically so much, but racially, ethnically, and so forth. So you have the politics, uh, uh, so you have ethnicities. And then lastly, and I would say this is less important than the first two, you have religious identities. So the largest group, uh, majority of the Middle East are Muslim. The majority of them are Sunni. You have a minority uh, Shi population. The one exception is Iran, which is a majority Shi population, minority um, Sunni population. Iraq, you also, actually Iraq and Lebanon, you also have a slight majority of um, populations being Shia as well. This is again something that gets emphasized. Uh, let me go back a minute. You also, of course, have um, Christian populations. You have Jewish populations. Historically, you had small but vibrant Jewish populations in many of the countries of the Middle East. Um, sadly, that's no longer the case in most of them, and we'll talk about why that is. And then you have smaller uh, religious groups. You have, for example, the Druze in Lebanon and um, northern Israel. You have um, other, uh, and when I say Christian, we want to also make sure that we don't make it a monolith, because you have lots and lots and lots of different Christian denominations um, in the Middle East. And then you have um, Jewish population, of course, predominantly in Israel. You have small Jewish populations in other parts of the world as well, in other parts of the region as well. Again, religion is often, in our news media consumption, is often given as the one main defining feature of the Middle East and the one way to explain tensions in the region or wars and so forth. So I really want to emphasize that that's not the case for two reasons. One is that the, the um, 20th and 21st century have really been dominated by secular political forces. So things like nationalism, for example, has been a much more dominant and, and a much stronger prevailing influence on how societies are ordered and how people see themselves and identify themselves than religion. So that's number one. Number two is that groups that seek to um, place religion front and center in their political agendas or in their social agendas have by and large been suppressed by secular regimes, whether in the Arab world, whether in Turkey. Iran is, again, the sort of exception that proves the rule. because You did have the Iranian revolution in 79. Iran does uh, run itself as a, um, as it calls itself, an Islamic Republic of Iran, which is really interesting that you have an Islamic Republic 
right? And so even though Iran is often called a theocracy, and in many ways it is, the fact that you maintain, the fact that it maintained Republican structures, you have elections, you have a parliament, you have a president, etc., and tried to sort of marry it with religious structures, but they couldn't abandon the Republican features of the country even though they proclaim to have religious legitimacy and authority and so forth. And it speaks to the dominance of secular modes of thinking and secular modes of um, or organizing culture, society, government, et cetera, over the, course of the, um, over the course of the 20th century. Question. Yes. It's strong armness coupled with petrodollars, coupled with British and American protection. So all, th uh, all three of those things sort of married together. So you have within Saudi, the, the Saudi government, you had the marrying of Al Saud, the ruling family, with a, a very unique um, and sort of Puritan authoritarian version of Islam. And so they mutually reinforced themselves. Um, they're able to do that and sort of placate their society through the petrodollars that they receive because they've been both blessed and cursed with a lot of oil. But then there's also the protections, um, first by the British and then now more so by the Americans, that allows them to continue to get away with it. I, would you say also that, that religion tends to be weaponized in the same way language? Mm -hmm. that absolutely, um, absolutely. And I'll give you a, a sort of quick example sort of anecdote <coughs> that, um, that I think highlights this really well. So back in 2003, in the fall of 2003, my husband and I lived in Beirut. He was a visiting um, professor at um, the American University of Beirut, and I was a PhD student doing research there. And back then, um, Ramadan fell in um, the fall, October, November. And uh, Beirut, for those of you who don't know, has amazing food, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> And we were by the university, and there's a, like a whole strip of kind of casual restaurants for catering mostly to university students, but we took advantage of them as well. So the way that restaurants in Beirut worked, most of them at least, and most of the um, sort of Muslim majority countries, the way that it worked is that rather than sitting down and ordering, in Ramadan they had a special setup, because you know that the whole restaurant is going to be filled, they're all going to be hungry, and they're all going to want to eat at exactly the same time. So the restaurants had a prefix menu. They would um, post it outside their door during the day, like today we're serving chicken and rice and soup and salad, whatever. So we'd like hop to different restaurants. And so we, you know, it was just my husband and me, um, and so we would sit in one of the two, two seater. But a lot of the other tables in the restaurants were um, filled with students. And you'd have six seats, eight seats, 10 seats, a whole row of students. And so the way that it worked, because I didn't cook in Beirut, why would I? So we went to restaurants every night. <laughs> um, and so the way that it would work is that everyone comes a few minutes before sunset, you know, fasting, hungry, and everything. Everyone on each table, there are some water bottles and some dates. So the tradition is to break fast with dates. And um, and then there'd be a, a TV playing the you know music videos or whatever. And then right when sunset hits. The, um, the, the way that you know that it's the exact moment of sunset is that you hear the call to prayer. And you can hear it outside in the streets, but then it's also on TV. So okay, there's a call to prayer. Um, you know, we, we drink our water, eat our dates, and then in a few minutes we know that the, um, the servers are gonna come with soup and salad and so on. But as I started looking around um, day after day after day, I noticed two things. One, was that not everyone was breaking their fast when we were. And then secondly, a few minutes later, 10, 15, 15, 20 minutes later, there would be a second call to prayer. And the people who hadn't broken their fast yet broke their fast after the second call to prayer. What's happening? I wasn't sure. What's happening is that at the table, you had a mixture of students who were Sunni and Shiri, the Sunni students were breaking their fast after the first adhan, the first call to prayer. The Shi'i students were breaking their fast after the second call to prayer. Why are there two calls to prayer? Because hundreds of years ago, <laughs> Islamic scholars had to determine, well, when exactly is sunset? Your iPhone's not going to tell you. 
So Sunni scholars arrived at a consensus that sunset, the, the moment of sunset is when the last bit of sun recedes behind the horizon. The Shi'i scholarly consensus is that the moment of sunset is when that last band of red recedes behind the horizon. So you end up with two calls to prayer, 10, 15 minutes apart, right? And then, the, 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 but the shared, um, what everybody agrees on, Sunni and Shi'i, is that you break your fast the minute the sun, the second the sun sets, not a minute before, and not a minute after. And so everyone is adhering to their shared, you know, the shared Sunni Shi'i uh, agreement that in Ramadan you break your fast the second the sun sets, but there are slightly different interpretations of when the sun sets, <laughs> right? So I learned about that, number one, and, but then what was also fascinating, once I figured out what's happening, I started observing the tables, and it was very mixed. Right, so, and you could never, like, the only way you would know who's Sunni and who's Shi is when they broke their fast. You wouldn't know by their names, you wouldn't know by their dress, you wouldn't know by, by how they were interacting with each other because they were all sort of together. And so, to me, and so it stuck with me, obviously, all of these, what, 17 years now, 16 years since that happened. And it's a really, I think, that to me says much, much more about Sunni Shi relations than anything we hear in the news anything we hear in the news, right? That people are coexisting, they have their own identity, and they're recognized, and, and people will know by their last names or where they come from, especially in Lebanon, you know, who's Sunni, who's Shiri, who's Christian, who's Druze, et cetera, but it doesn't matter, right? It's, a th it, it's not that we've erased the differences, there's still a lot of diversity, religious diversity, in those societies, but there's also a lot of connectivity, they're connecting as university students, they're connecting as people of the same age, et cetera. So when we think about religion, religious identity, or any of the other identities of the Middle East, we want to remember that tensions, conflict, war, those are the exceptions and not the rule. The rule is the very subtle, quotidian, everyday interactions that no one can capture on the news, right? No one's going to tell you, oh, today, or, uh, American University of Beirut students broke their fast together. <laughs> no one's going to do that. But that's really the more reflective of the reality than, than, what, we, um, than what we see. Okay. So um, I sort of gave you, in list form, some of the ethnolinguistic uh, groups. And so here we have a map that shows it a little bit more. And so, the, again, not complete, because North Africa isn't on here. It's the best I could do. So we have the yellow, which are variations of Arabic. We have the green, which are variations of Turkish. We have the maroon, which are variations of Kurdish. And then we have Iran, which is sort of its own thing, right? So the oranges and the peaches are Persian, but you can also see a lot of different, you see some, you can this way. You have, um, the yellow, the different Arabic-speaking populations. You have the green, which is Turkoman, which is a sort of rela related to Turkish. You have Kurdish up into northwestern Iran, right? Um, and then you have the purple, which I'm not even, I think it's Baluchistan up here. So, and then you have it sort of extending into Afghanistan. So you can see the tremendous diversity. So the other thing that I want to really emphasize is when we think about diversity, we tend to think about it in like, binaries, right? There's Turkish and Kurdish. There's Arabic and Persian. There's um, Arabic and, and Berber, right? But that binary also does a disservice to all of the fluidity that we see in the region. And this is not even getting into Arabic dialects, right? Dialects is like a whole other, whole other phenomenon, which I'll come back to in a moment. Similarly, with religions of the Middle East, you have lots of different, um, again, it's not a binary situation. So the light green here is Sunni Muslim, the dark green is Shia Muslim, the um, sort of orange red is um, Judaism, Christianity is in the purple, um, and then you have pockets of other um, in the dark. So the light purple is Christian, and then the dark purple is, um, is other some Druze and some other population. So again, very uh, diverse, 
and not monolithic. You have pockets here, pockets there, and so forth, which also relates to the fact that geographic location is often a marker of one's ethnic, linguistic, or religious identity. So certain cities, certain villages, certain towns are known for being um, predominantly Sunni or Shia or Christian or Druze and so forth. And so it's all mixed together. And so what there, there's a temptation to want to um, prioritize. Right? Do people identify primarily as Muslim or primarily by nation or primarily by ethno-linguistic group or primarily by what have you? And the fact is that they're all intermixed. They're all intermixed. So someone who's from, uh, I don't know, someone who's from where? Someone who's from the Galilee, say, from Nazareth, which is in Israel, in northern Israel, uh, would say, could very easily say, I'm a Palestinian in Nazareth. <coughs> and could identify as, you might know from their last name, maybe their last name is Huri. Huri is the Arabic word for priest. It's sort of a telltale sign that they're a Christian. But then their last name might be Haddad. Haddad means a uh, carpenter, and, or uh, iron worker. And that could be Christian or Muslim. Nassar, my name, uh, Maha Nassar, you can find Nassars from the Sinai through Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, etc. Uh, Maha Nassar is a very com is a very popular name among Christian Nassars. Nassar is a very po common Christian name. So uh, I often get confused, and then people look at me like, oh, you're not a Christian. <laughs> Uh, so, so there are more, so it's all intertwined is what I really want to emphasize here. Sometimes there are very clear markers by name, by city, by town. Sometimes it's very ambiguous uh, what someone's ethno-religious, linguistic um, uh, identity is. And people like it that way. You know, I have a friend who's Lebanese who has a very ambiguous name. And even Lebanese don't know, can't like quite pinpoint where she's from. They ask her what town or city she's from. She says Beirut. It doesn't help anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, she likes it that way. And if someone says, well, what are you? She's like, I'm Lebanese. Deal with it. <laughs> you know? So, um, and so the fluidity and the layers, the multi-layers, and the fact that people live with that multiplicity together and don't necessarily try to extract or prioritize one over the other is really important to all of this. Um, okay, this I wanted to give you a sense of population density, where people live in the Middle East. The short answer, spoiler alert, they live by water, right? So they live on the coasts, go this way. They live on the coasts of North Africa, right? They live along the coast of Egypt in the Nile Delta. They live along the Mediterranean Sea, um, and they live along the coast of the Red Sea and the coast of the Gulf and the Arabian Sea, okay? This area is literally called the empty quarter. It is empty, it's just desert. And um, so yeah, people wanna live by water. But again, we wanna think about where in the Middle East we're talking about. We wanna be specific geographically. Um, Libya is a huge country. It's got six million people in it, all primarily along the coast there. And so, uh, population distribution is really important. Urban rural is going <coughs> to become really important. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's something else. So I mentioned dialect a few minutes ago. Um, so in the Arab world, you have um, 400 plus million people, over 400 million people who speak Arabic. The Arabic that they learn in school, the Arabic that they hear on news broadcasts, the Arabic that they read in a newspaper, is not the same Arabic that they speak at home. And it can be a little different, it can be really different. And so when we think about education levels, when we think about the ways in which people access knowledge, um, we're gonna talk about the ways that people access knowledge through social media. Um, the registers of Arabic that people use can be very different. When we talk about identity, there are also clear identities within the Arab world. So I mentioned ethno-linguistic identity and I mentioned sort of Arabness and Arab League and Arab world and so forth, but within the Arab world, there are clear distinctions. Um, there are four main ones that we see here. There's the Maghribi, Maghrib means uh, West, so sort of North Africa or West, Af North West Africa. So the Maghribi region has uh, similarities in terms of the dialects of that region. 
Uh, you also have a large Amazigh population that has influenced the ways in which language, ethnicity, culture, food has been, um, has developed there. Egypt is its <laughs> own thing, uh, both linguistically and geographically. You have this green area known that's known as the Levant. Again, sort of a dated term, but useful in terms of thinking about uh, sort of the Eastern Mediterranean. So it includes um, Syria, it includes Jordan, it includes Israel, Palestine, Lebanon. Iraq is sometimes grouped with the Levant in your um, Arab survey, it is, but it's kind of not. Um, and then you have the Gulf, which is its own uh, uh, sort of region. And then Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, um, Mauritania are sort of their own, sort of related, but sort of different. But the four or five main regions I would say is Maghrebi, Egyptian, Levantine, Gulf, um, and then Iraq is kind of on its own. So the, here we have regional distinctions and regional um, characteristics. The food, for example, so you'll have a lot of couscous in the Maghrib, not so much in the Levant. Right? You'll have rice is more predominant there. So um, sort of cuisine, language, um, some of the cultural dimensions like that are, are um, found. Traditional dress, traditional dance, things like that. You can also distinguish them by region. Okay. So, so I was uh, I'm going to I was going to give you a historical overview starting with the um, 18th century, but I'm actually going to go back. Let me use this map here. Let me start here. I'm going to sort of give a really brief, like 30 second pre 18th century overview of the Middle East, starting with the rise of Islam. 1400 years of Middle Eastern history. In 30 seconds, go. <laughs> so, um, so Islam started in the, Gul in the Hijaz, in the sort of coastal region of the Gulf. And that's where the Arab tribes are originally from, from the Arabian Peninsula, essentially. These regions were not Arab. You did not have Arabs living there until you had the rise and spread of Islam. As Islam spread in these regions, so, and Iran and Turkey are a little bit different, but as Islam spread in these regions at least, Arab culture spread with it. And so, for example, Coptic was a dominant language and ethnic group in Egypt uh, over the course of the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries. Uh, Coptic became uh, much less used. As we started to see the spread of Islam move westward into North Africa, you had interesting um, tensions, frankly, between people who wanted to adopt the religion but not the culture. And some of what we see today with a uh, re-reclamation of Amazigh identity, for example, is a continuation uh, or maybe a different manifestation of some of those earlier things. One of the other characteristics of the entirety of the Middle East uh, in the pre-18th, pre-19th century is the dominance of multi-ethnic, multilinguistic empires. So the Ottoman Empire, the most famous one and the most long-lasting, based, um, based in Istanbul and ruled over at least the coastal areas of these regions for several hundred years. And while they emphasized Islamic identity, they were very uh, hands-off in terms of other dimensions of identity, and they were actually pretty hands-off in terms of religion as well. So for much of the region, uh, for much of the history of the region, governments did not ha were not involved in people's day-to-day -day lives. You had local religious authorities, you had um, town elders or sheikhs, uh, sort of local people, who would really be the ones who arbitrated in people's lives, settle disputes, marriage and divorce, record birth and death, and so forth. With the advent of the modern world, as we move into the 18th century, um, as Europe was becoming stronger, as the Ottoman and uh, Safavid Qajar rulers in Iran were becoming weaker, those governments were seeking ways to um, strengthen themselves militarily, socially, economically. So they adopted a number of reforms, including, uh, most consequentially, a greater involvement of the government in people's day-to-day -day lives. That didn't happen overnight, but it happened through bureaucratic reforms that affected how people um, interacted with the government. The other major change that happened was the rise of nationalism, 
We know um, from European history how nationalism sort of spread throughout Europe in the late 18th, early 19th century. It also arrives in the Middle East, um, sort of in the second half of the 19th century, and people start identifying more and more in terms of their national identity, which is often defined um, linguistically. So nation and language have been very much intertwined in the Middle East from the very beginning. The other major challenge that the uh, region faced during this time period was the challenge of European domination. So you have um, Britain, France, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire seeking resources, natural resources from the region, seeking to control the, um, eco uh, the economy and the resources of the region, and often using uh, weaponizing, I would say, the uh, diversity, the, especially the religious diversity of the region in order to make inroads into the region. So as the, in other words, as the reforms are happening, one of the things that the Ottomans and Qajars in particular, the, the Middle Eastern um, empires had to constantly sort of keep an eye over their shoulder because they were um, sort of being attacked from the rear flank by Western powers who were saying, you are mistreating your minority populations, especially Christian populations. We need to come in and intervene. Intervene in your politics, in your economy. We need to have a greater say and so forth. Some of it was, I'm sure, uh, religious affinities. So the French were particularly interested in the Maronites who were affiliated with the Catholics. The Russians were very interested in the Orthodox because they too are Orthodox, etc. cetera. They had missionary schools and so forth. But it ended up meaning that earlier forms of social coexistence got warped in many ways in over the course, especially of the 19th century, that continues to affect some of the, and continues to um, have reverberations in some of the tensions that we see today. As we move into the 20th century, uh, especially after World War I, Britain, gain, uh, Britain and France primarily gained control, either direct or indirect, over much of the region. And so the interwar period is really a struggle for independence against colonial and imperial regimes. After World War II, as we move into the 50s and 60s, many of these countries gain formal independence. Um, a lot of these countries use that independence to help make improvements in people's lives. So one of the things that happens when you have foreign control over any government or any society, they like to cultivate elite who are loyal to them, and they get rewarded quite handsomely in exchange. And so you had, in, from the 20s to the 40s, huge gaps between the haves and have-nots in most of these countries. You, know, you had a very narrow strata of wealthy landowners, and you had a vast majority of peasants who were quite weak, uh, quite poor, and exploited. So in the 50s and 60s, one of the things that happens is a lot of these newly independent governments start passing land reform laws and expand the public sector to have employment, expand the education sector, expand the health sector, et cetera. It's also where you start to see a, a real spike in population growth because people are living longer. But this was also the time dominated by Cold War politics. And so, the, again, the, the um, leaders of these various countries had to both navigate their domestic policies and projects, as well as try to navigate the rather um, squirrely politics of the Cold War. And what was often defined as sort of in Cold War terms by, say, US um, CENTCOM or State Department or what have you, was actually defined in anti-imperial terms um, in the region because of their history of having to deal with imperialism and colonialism which often leads to misunderstandings and um, other problems in the region. Um, as we move through the, into the 70s and 80s, we see the rise of the security state. This is when we start seeing massive expansions. It was already happening before, but you see massive expansions of surveillance technologies, um, the use of jailing and torture and all those kinds of things. And it's also the time where you start to see the neoliberal reforms being introduced into these countries. This is the time of the Washington Consensus, the IMF, the World Bank. And you, this is when you start to see bread riots, right? 
Dr. Boom gave several examples in Morocco in the late 70s and 80s and into the 90s. Any country you go to, you're going to have similar. We didn't have bread riots in 1958, for example, because we had states that were very keen on expanding the public sector and so forth. As you have um, pressure for cutting subsidies, for example, cutting the public sector, expanding the private sector, because you don't have at the same time the uh, laws and rules in place that allow for a fairness in the system, you end up with a re-expansion re of the wealth gap between the haves and have-nots. And we see this continue into the 1990s with what becomes known as crony capitalism. So if you're tight with the regime, you get the uh, bids and you get the contracts and then you get to pocket a good part of the money because no one's going to come after you because you're close to the regime who gave you the bid. You can see how it goes, right? And so more and more people are left out of the system. Again, we see on, on, on paper, the IMF, the World Bank, whatever, they say, oh, these countries are making progress. Look at the stock exchange. Look at the um, you know, different economic indicators. But what they're not looking at are how people on the street, the have-nots, are, um, are, are, are sort of handling things and dealing with things. And what they're finding on the ground is you're finding increased frustration with corruption and authoritarianism. And those are really the precipitating factors that led to the Arab uprisings and continue until today where people are seeking, especially millennials, global, um, seeking national dignity and global, um, global connections. 